not the country your dad told you about. We're obsolete. Fucking powers that be, they don't give a shit about some loser in Maylands, man. What's wrong with Maylands? Well, I could buy and walk from the station. But Maylands is not the... Good afternoon, gentlemen. If you're not the business man, you're not a man. Some kind of law bred mollusk even China wouldn't be in fit for export. Oh, I think this is what you... Shit! All I need is a chance, and if you give me that chance, I know you won't regret it. And everyone deserves that much, right? So the last time I left off talking about Good For Nothing Blues, we just had our Kickstarter and unfortunately it had failed. But we didn't leave things there, we were determined to get the movie made, it just meant we had to wait a little bit longer than that to get everything underway. And that actually meant an entire year before we could actually start shooting. So what did I do in that year? Well the first thing I did is that I went to all the major Kickstarter contributors and I asked them whether they'd be interested in still giving their contribution without the official Kickstarter campaign involvement. Um, and thankfully a few of them certainly were. And so between all of those, friends and family, I managed to raise $4,000 of funding for the film. In that time I myself was working and I raised a bit of money myself even though I wasn't making a whole lot of money but I still needed more. So I spoke to a guy named Aaron Camp. He'd helped me before with Subject 36, my first film, and getting that distributed. And I spoke to him because he has actually made his own film. It's called Hidden Light. It's a feature film as well. And to fund that, he actually approached a bunch of local investors, people who are just sort of passionate about films and passionate about the local movie scene and want to get involved. And through him, I got in touch with a guy called Jag Panu. Jag's a really good guy. He's invested in a lot of films in Perth, low budget films. And he was happy to contribute $4,000 to the film uh, as an investment, of course. Uh, I did promise him a return, which I've paid back a large bit of so far. So between what I'd raised, what I'd been given from friends and family, and what I got from Jag, altogether I had about 12 grand to put into the film. I mean, when I think about it, it was more like ten and a half grand when we first started, but by the end I'd put in a little bit more of my own money and that made it up to about twelve grand. The thing with a year though is that it's a long time, and a lot can change in a year. And one of the things that changed for us, sadly, was that we lost a few of our main cast. Uh, it was just, you know, complications uh, with scheduling and other plans that they'd made in that time, which is completely understandable because it's a year and things do change. So we had to recast Avani, which was Liz Joseph's role, and we had to recast Hank, who was being played by Jackson Jarvis. The good thing was the replacement for these cast members were fantastic. We had Avani played by Andrea Lim, and Hank played by Reese Hyatt, who was someone I discovered just by chance, actually when I was looking for one of the smaller roles. So in the end, even though it was a hurdle, we didn't lose anything, we still got a fantastic cast, and honestly, I can't even imagine anyone playing those characters anymore. It's just become through the process of making the film that those are distinctively those characters and they're absolutely fantastic in the role. We also added a few cast members in smaller roles, including Jimmy Kilday, who plays Daryl, and James Broadhurst, who plays Quigley, who's a psychotic cop. One of the biggest hurdles in pre-production was finding our locations. We had to find two apartments for the main locations for the film, one of which we had for four days, the other for eight days. What I did in the end was I went to Airbnb and I just private messaged some people who had apartment locations. The vast majority were not interested. They did not like the whole filming in the apartment thing at all. But there were a few people who were just, you know, very nice people who were happy to let us film there and we actually found some really good locations that way. The main apartment location that we found for the boys' apartment in the film is so unique and we're really lucky to have been able to find something like that. I expected that we'd get something like a boring standard apartment, but actually it was a sort of a vintage apartment that uh, had a lot of sort of mid-century vibes to it. And it had this unique chalkboard wall where we'd sketch a bunch of things that we had from the perspective of the characters and it really added a sort of uniqueness to the location. I also personally spent a lot of time driving around Maylands and some other suburbs like Jundana, Tewitt Hill, Hamilton Hill, uh, down near Fremantle, and we 
use that sort of scouting to find a lot of the outdoor locations in the film. Because of the tone of the film we were going for with the focus on crime and this sort of lethargic rundown sort of feel, we went for a lot of places with older buildings that were sort of dilapidated and uh, things like overgrown grass, dirty alleyways and stuff like that that really contributed to that feeling of a world that's sort of been abandoned and left to rot to some extent. Unlike my first film where I really didn't give enough time to it, I really wanted to dedicate some proper time to rehearsals for this film so that when we were on set we didn't have to worry too much about nailing down the characters' motivations and all that in the performances. It would be something that we'd already sorted out and we were ready to go and get into the nitty gritty and get as much done as we could with our limited time. So for that reason we had eight days of rehearsals total in which we covered the majority of the scenes and we figured out what the characters' motivations are in this scene, lots of little moments of how they interact and one of the things I wanted to do with this film is I wanted to do a lot of single takes where the entire scene plays out, or a large part of the scene at least, plays out in a single shot where you have a group set of characters. And the reason I wanted to do that was a lot of the comedy in the film is very fast paced and it's a lot of playing off each other. So I'd have three or four characters, maybe five characters in the scene and they're all interacting in unique ways with each other. And I didn't want to have to be doing all this cutting where you have to focus on one character at a time. I wanted the audience to be able to watch it and get something unique every time they watch it by paying attention to different characters and seeing how they react to like these little subtle things and how it plays with the group dynamics and changes the motivations within the scene. So for that reason, we really had to nail everything in the rehearsals and figure out exactly why they're doing every single little thing that they're doing in the scene and get the timing just right because there would be a bit of overlap as well, overlap in the dialogue, and we wanted to nail that so it wasn't something we had to be too worried about on the day. In the end, these are some of the best scenes in the film, I think. If anything, the scenes that suffered a little bit in the film were actually some of the quieter moments. Uh, all the group stuff was really good and it's really some of the scenes where we had just like two people together just having a very personal interaction where I think we needed a few more rehearsal days but for the most part I think it turned out really well. One of the biggest problems with making a movie for such a tiny amount of money is respecting the time of your cast and crew. Um, I of course am extremely grateful for the time that they gave me but what I didn't want to do was make them take out, say, 30 days to dedicate purely to the film. And so what I had to do was work around everybody else, basically. That meant that I didn't have a consistent crew that we were able to get on board. It was pretty much whoever was available on the day. And it meant we had a few blocks, but for the most part, we were working around everybody's availability. So all the cast had to be free on the same day and not have work or at least be able to reorganize their work. So what that meant was going into the project, we really didn't have a set schedule beyond like the first week or so and beyond a few blocks that we'd booked in for the apartment locations. So a large part of the production was going to have to be improvised. But that's something we can leave for another video. Sorry it's been so long guys, but please, if you're new to my channel, please like, subscribe, hit the bell, blah blah blah, various things you're supposed to say on YouTube, and I'll see you later.